We'll start uh, by acknowledging the traditional territory of the Lekwungen speaking people on which uh, we do our work, including connecting artists with audiences. And uh, these territories are now um, shared land, but uh, we, like I said, acknowledge uh, the Wasanich, Esquimalt, and Songhees First Nations, um, who are the uh, rightful and traditional land bearers. So, um, my name is Kagan McFadden, and I'm the executive director of the Victoria Arts Council. And uh, this is a special Creative Morning because uh, with the Victoria Arts Council and Creative Mornings, we try as much as we can to offer partnerships um, where uh, we can promote other community events going on. And Leah will expand on this a little bit, but I'll just say as also the president of the, <laughs> the board of directors for the Victoria Festival of Authors, uh, it's a very special partnership uh, between uh, VAC and the VFA uh, to present Romigato. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass it over to Leah McGinnis, the outreach coordinator for uh, Victoria Arts Council. Thank you, Kagan. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to thank our sponsors. So I'm going to share my screen and I have um, some images to go through. Uh, so welcome to Creative Mornings. Um, we're, uh, we're very um, thankful uh, to have you here with us this morning. September's theme is dare. To dare is an act of faith. We work up the nerve to make the soaring leap, even when we don't know the out what the outcome will be. At the core of daring, you'll find bravery and defiance entwined. We dare to challenge the stories passed down to us that no longer fit, the stories that li limit our imagination. Creative Mornings Porto Alegre chose September's theme of dare and Midi uh, Mendoza illustrated the theme. We'd like to thank MailChimp. Uh, MailChimp is Creative Mornings official global par uh, partner for marketing. Have you heard of the podcast Call Paul? As part of the wide ranging MailChimp Presents lineup, Paul Jarvis interviews entrepreneurs who prioritize passion over profit and renegotiate the status quo. It's full of wisdom, practical insights and inspiration for all creatives. In the first episode of season two, Paul Jarvis interviews Austin Cleon, the former Creative Morning speaker and a prolific blogger, illustrator and author. Austin explains how creativity and commerce don't have to be at odds. We'd also like to thank Skillshare, um, our global partner for online learning. Skillshare is an online learning community helping millions take the next step on their creative journey. With the right mindset, you actually don't need to be famous to make a living from your art. In the first episode of this free Skillshare YouTube series, Unmaking the Myth, Andy J. Pizza debunks common myths about audience growth and explains just how, or how just 1,000 true fans can offer substantial success. For more, subscribe to Skillshare's YouTube channel and keep up with the latest from Unmaking the Myth, where Andy defies the conventional wisdom of makers and creators every week. And I'm gonna put the link to this YouTube in the chat so you can check it out afterwards. We'd also like to thank the city of Victoria and HCMA. HCMA is an architecture firm that designs buildings, brands, and shared experiences that connect people. Uh, so we, uh, as, as hosts of Creative Mornings, um, we're at the Victoria Arts Council. So uh, we would like to promote our, our current exhibition, a solo exhibition from Samantha Dickey called A Moment in Time. This exhibition runs until October 31st. So if you haven't already, and if you're in the area, please come on down to uh, our main gallery in Old Town Chinatown and um, check out this amazing exhibition. As Kagan mentioned, we are also in partnership with the Victoria Festival of Authors. Uh, this exciting event begins September 29th and runs to October 3rd. And uh, Hiromi, uh, our speaker today, Hiromi Gatto, is going to be participating in this Festival of Authors as well. Uh, so you can go to victoriafestivalofauthors.ca and, and look at lineups of events, speaker series, and, and find out more.
So without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome our speaker for today, Hiromo, Hiromi Goto. Hiromi Goto is an immigrant from Japan who gratefully resides in Lekwungen territory. Her first novel, Chorus of Mushrooms, won the 1995 Commonwealth Writers Prize Best First Book, Canada and Caribbean Region, and was the co-winner of the J Canada Japan Book Award. Her second adult novel, The Kappa Child, was awarded the 2001 James Tip Tiptree Jr. Memorial Award. She's published three novels for children and youth, a book of poetry, and a collection of short stories for adults. Her other honors include the Sunburst Award and the Carl Brandon Parallax Award. Hiromi's most recent book, Shadow Life, published in 2001 with artist Anne Shu, uh, and published by First Second Books, is her first graphic novel. She's currently, uh, she is currently at work trying to decolonize her relationship to writing and to be a responsible guest on Indigenous lands. Hiromi Gato is represented by Cook McDermott. So um, without, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our speaker today, Hiromi. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Likwangan speaking people and their traditional territories. Um, my partner and I moved here just last year in the midst of the pandemic to live closer to our mothers. Um, and um, we also wanted to have a quieter life outside the city. And we're so grateful to be able to have that here. Um, so to the Songi, Esquimalt and Wusanich people, taihen osewa ni domo arigato gozaimasu. Thank you for joining me today on Creative Mornings. It's, it's an honor to be uh, a guest. Uh, yoroshiku o And uh, I have to confess to being a little self-conscious about the tema. Uh, today's tema is dare. Um, and because I'm a writer and um, the things I can talk about with confidence uh, are either my writing books and my, my stories um, or about my personal life. And so to try to frame those things around the idea of, of dare uh, feels a bit like a self brag. Um, so it makes it feel a little like, oh, it's so embarrassing. Uh, but this is the task set before me and one must dare to dive into it. So there you go. Um, so what will follow today is kind of like a, a, a spiraling discussion and with bits of excerpts from my novels, um, circling around what I think of as the idea of dare or to be daring um, in, in different kinds of ways. So at the end of my discussion, um, I'd also like to uh, posit a writing prompt for those of you who feel inclined. Um, if there's time, um, we'll just uh, have the writing prompt um, write, uh, ha have you write, um, and then perhaps share some, some of your words. If there's time, um, we'll see uh, depending on Q&A and whatnot. Um, so, I'm going to take you back to um, my first novel, uh, Chorus of Mushrooms. And um, this was written yonks ago now um, in the 1990s. Like some, you know, sometimes I run into young people and, and they're like, oh, you know, I was, I was born in, in, in like 2000. I'm just like, what the heck? <laughs> like people are born in 2000. And then anyways, that kind of tells you, you know, at what stage of my life I'm in. Um, and um, Chorus of Mushrooms was written yonks ago. I was um, in my early 20s. And um, it was at the time of my life, um, I was coming into understanding more critically um, and less intuitively, like more consciously realizing the forces of, of systemic racism. And um, uh, systemic racism and sexism and how that imposed upon my life in all kinds of ways. Um, so before that critical understanding it was more a sense of, oh, this doesn't feel right. Like I remember being a, a child and people would say things or do things and it would just like, that's not nice or I don't 
like how that feels or this feels funny there's something wrong but not being able to name what that wrongness was um and it was only through reading and um critical discussion and then you know yay uh what was called uh women's studies but it's now um called gender studies now um, but at the time when I was going through women's studies and like really realizing, oh, there's actually these social systems at force that is imposing upon my life in unwanted ways. Um, and it was all about power. And it just like, wow, blow my mind. Um, and really being able to recognize that um, through language, uh, change things in, in a fundamental ways. And so this all this learning was going on in in the um, in my uh, 20 in my mid 20s and um, I started taking creative writing courses um, after uh, I finished my BA and I was still you know like 24 or something I got married to a Japanese Canadian man and we started a family and I started writing course of mushrooms and um, there was this one point during the writing of it, I was taking creative workshops at the University of Calgary at the time. Um, and one of my cohorts was a, a middle-aged white man. And I'd um, written this short story about uh, a young Japanese Canadian woman. And in the story, um, she was shy and, and quiet. And um, my cohorts in his critique said, isn't this character a cliche? And I felt the rage rising up in my head, <laughs> coming up on my face, like, <laughs> like, like a flame on. <laughs> and um, I said, no, that is not my cliche. That is your cliche. And it was like the start of some burning, burning fire in me. Um, and I realized that I can, speak to this legacy of erasure or distortion um, set up by um, mainstream normative culture um, and uh, just, uh, you know white supremacist culture, um, which is entrenched in, in the uh, um, education system, uh, particularly in how history is taught, all the gaps of, of knowledge and information, all the erased stories. Um, and so with writing, I mean, you can't do everything at once in writing, but there are many things that you can address um, within a story. Uh, and I, I, and um, I think of course of mushrooms, my, so most directly um, consciously in your face political uh, of, of my books. And I, and I, I think all books um, are political texts because they're infused with the author's um, intentions of sharing ideas and once we share an idea that is a political act um, whether you define it as political or not because we are all political beings um, we have all our our belief systems in place and and they inflect how and inform how we choose to tell story um, which is why it's so important that we have such a wide, wide range of authors whose stories are shared so that we can better understand one another. So I think of course of Mushrooms as my most political of books. Um, and um, I'm gonna read a short excerpt from it. Um, so Course of Mushrooms is about um, primarily an older uh, 85 year old Japanese a uh, Canadian woman and her granddaughter, uh, Murasaki, who grows up in a household where Japanese is not spoken, but her grandmother only speaks in Japanese because she's very um, angry about uh, the whole colonial system and refuses to speak English on principle, um, although she understands it. And the granddaughter only speaks English because her mother decided to um, quote unquote assimilate and stop speaking Japanese altogether. So it's it's a house that's kind of fractured across culture and language um, in complex ways. So the the story set it on a mushroom farm, um, and um, the grandmother, who's never left the house, 
uh, for years and years, decides to just finally leave. And then the granddaughter is, is left to um, pick up the pieces after she's left. So this is from the point of view of the granddaughter, Murasaki. Local elderly woman disappears, search continues. Late Tuesday night, the immigrant mother-in-law of local mushroom farmer, Sam Tonkatsu, went missing during blizzard-like snow conditions. We're very worried, says Sam's wife. We just want her to come home. Local RCMP and neighboring ranchers are combing the countryside, but weather conditions hinder their search. Cases like this are difficult, says Constable Norton. An elderly woman isn't likely to survive a single night during weather we've been, think, we've been experiencing. What is surprising is that most town folks were unaware that the old woman was even living with tonkatsus. Foul play has been ruled out. What happened to your grandma? She went back to Japan. She got sick of all this snow and dust and up and left. I don't blame her. What happened to your grandma? She went apeshit and was raving, frothing at the mouth, and she ran naked from the house, screaming like the pagan she is. What happened to your grandma? She started to grow fur all over her body, and at first we thought it was a symptom of illness or something like she wasn't eating enough, so her body was compensating with fur to keep her warm, but we found out she was actually a tanuki who had assumed the form of a woman so she could marry my grandfather because he because he set her free from a trap and she wanted to thank him by becoming his wife, but now she wanted to return to the wilds whence she came. I found out then that everybody, including me, was always looking for a story. That the story could be anything. They would eat it. Mind you, the story can be anything, but there have to be details. People love details. The stranger, the more exotic, the better. Ooh, they say, ah, nothing like a freak show to make you feel normal, safe by comparison. Tell us about the feet, they say. Did your grandmother have to bind her feet when she was little? Actually, feet were not bound in Japan, but someone keeps on perpetuating this. It always goes back to that, the binding of the feet, deformities, ritual hairy carry. Actually, it's harakiri, but go on saying hairy carry for all I care. It's not about being bitter. You're invited somewhere to be a guest speaker, to give a keynote address, whatever that is. Everybody in suits and ties and designer dresses, you're the only colored person there who is not serving food. It's not about being bitter. You just notice people talk race this, ethnic that. It's easy to be theoretical if the words are coming from a face that has little or no pigmentation. If your name is Hank and you have three blonde kids, no one will come up to you to the Safeway produce section and point at a vegetable and ask, what is that? Um, So that was my first novel, and um, I consider it very overtly uh, political um, for reasons. Um, but you know, I'm not interested in recreating uh, the same book over and over again. Um, and so, in my second book, um, *The Cup of Child*, um, I wanted to explore uh, ideas of gender. Uh, queer identity, belonging, and family trauma, um, but also really try to delve into uh, a more decolonial framework for uh, talking on indig talking about living on Indigenous lands. Um, and at the time, uh, I wrote Chorus of Mushrooms. Um, I didn't do that, um, and I wanted to speak to that erasure uh, in the Cup of Child which is also set on uh, Treaty 7 lands um, in what's called Southern Alberta. Um, so I wanted to have Japanese Canadian subjectivity, um, not dissimilar to what I experienced living in, in the prairies. 
um, but also having to bring to the to the page um, the significance um, and and the reality of, of, of living on um, indigenous lands. Um, so in the Kappa child, the, the main character um, who remains um, ungendered uh, through the text um, grows up on the prairies and um, their family moved from the west coast um, to the prairies and the unnamed ungendered main character um, does finds this, the change from the, the wet coast to the dry prairies to be uh, physically and environmentally like very shocking to their system. And um, they try to understand what, um, what this move means to them through their beloved childhood book, Little House on the Prairie, uh, which those of you who are from you know, my age group um, not, or even younger, um, it's, it's a very famous and popular uh, colonial text, uh, which romanticizes sort of the pioneer experience. Um, and I, I drew from that, that book because I, as a child, I, I loved that book. Um, I loved this TV series um, and it had a, a sort of a, you know, it left a big um, impression upon me um, as, as a childhood book. And um, I returned to it as an adult um, after the women's studies classes. And I was reading it as an adult through a, a critical lens. And I was just flabbergasted and just dismayed by how much um, racism was informing that book. And I was just like, holy smokes, whoa. Like I inhaled that book. Like, you know, it brought it into my body and my mind and my heart. And it was kind of a, a, a you know, sort of a groundwork of, a, of one's imagination of how, how to imagine um, land. And so land and, and nation building, right? So it's happening in these children's books um, and children necess don't necessarily know that um, while they're reading it. But and so that so it, even more important that you know teachers and librarians are reading these texts with a critical lens because um, uh, it was just kind of shocking to me at the time when I, I reread it as an adult and so I thought oh my gosh like what the heck there's like so much wrong with this book how can I um, kind of I guess undo that um, and I thought well I can speak back to a childhood book in a novel. Um, and so when I, when I do that, you, you kind of start dismantling those power structures um, that are, you know, those found, foundational stories to the imagination of, of nation in, in some ways, which is set up as sort of romantic um, and heroic in the pioneer story. Um, but it's based on, on this groundwork of racism and violence, which gets erased. Um, and so you can speak back to those things. And that this is what the wonderful thing I find about writing for me has been the capacity to speak back to that which was erased or silenced without my consent or without my knowledge. Um, and writing allows for that. You can, you can scroll things back, you can um, rewrite it. Um, and, I, and I don't mean like rewrite things like uh, Holocaust deniers, you know, <laughs> I'm not, you know, which, which is sort of like, you know, the bad end of rewriting. Um, but for me, especially if you are coming to story or coming to a place of understanding uh, power dynamics um, in um, places like story, publication, um, education, how all these things work, um, it's a way to be able to assert oneself. Um, and assert a, a different kind of seeing or knowing, um, especially if it's been one that's um, silenced. So the Kappa Cha was a very, it wasn't easy to write, it was very complicated in, in its structure, but um, you know, 
back to the personal, um, during the time of the writing of, of this um, second adult novel, um, I was actually going through sort of major life changes as well. Um, I had been I already had uh, two young children and um, my marriage with my then partner um, had been fraying for, for several years um, uh, to all, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and, you know, always in retrospect, I, I think I got married too young, but you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> you did it, it's a done deal. Um, but, um, I also came to the realization that that I was queer, um, and it was a sense of recognition. But I was also shocked because, again, coming from uh, these very small rural places, um, a Christian family, and um, you know, very small conservative towns, um, I didn't have any real sense of queer identity or culture. Uh, un until I hit university. And so this realization that, that I was queer came, you know, quite a bit later um, than what we see on TV specials where all these kids know when they're, you know, in, in junior high school or something. It was just like, I felt like I got, you know, it was like, it was like, like gong, more. it's like gong. And it was just like, oh no, I'm queer. <laughs> and, and I was already married. Um, I had children. I was like, what, what now? Um, and I was scared uh, because um, I, I didn't want to be a single mom. I don't think I was capable of it. Um, and my family, what would they think? And it was just horrible, horrible time. Um, but uh, I, I came out because I, I didn't if, have a choice in so much that I, I can't live a pretend life. Um, and, and this isn't to critique people who live double lives because I know so much is at stake. Um, I, I absolutely do not judge people who live double lives. It, it, it's, it, it must be very hard. Um, and there's a lot that can be lost um, by coming out. And I don't think that's right. I think, you know, we should, everybody should be safe to come out. Um, as they want and as they like, but it, it, it's it is not socially safe to be out uh, for everyone, particularly from different cultures and different um, religions, religious backgrounds. You could lose everything, um, and so you know, for me, what is the point of what? What for me, the question was, what? What is the point of breakage? Like, what? What will break you? Um, and what would break me was to live a pretend life. Um, and for other people, it might be the point of breaking would be to lose my culture and lose my community would break me. So, you know, then you live a double life. Um, it, it's not a hard, it's not an easy life at all. Um, but, you know, at that time I, I had, I felt that I had to come out and no regrets, because here I am, here and queer, all great. <laughs> um, and I don't have regrets, uh, but it was a very, very hard time. And, um, you know, I only made it because of my uh, queer friends and straight allies who supported me so well. Um, and um, so that was going on during the writing of The Cup of Child. And um, yeah, it, it was, um, there are moments in your life where you have to make a big change or a big decision. Um, and, you know, I, I, I believe like even small choices changes the direct direction or the trajectory of one's life in, in small ways. But, um, you know, if you like, you, you, you nudge a, a decision one way or another, you're, you're gonna end up in vastly different places. And it's like, sometimes if you think about it too much, it'll just like, you know, blow your mind and you can't do it. Um, and so, you know, the choice has to be made 
in that moment, it's kind of like, you know, am I going to jump into that really cold, uh, cold uh, ocean or not? Because, you know, it's going to hurt. It's going to be really painful. But, um, you know, it's like, I got to do it. I got to do it. And you jump. And then it's like, oh, it's, a, it's actually not so bad. Or, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's really shocking. But I feel alive or, you know, all these different things. But um, I, I, my, many of my stories are, are speculative fiction. Um, where there's elements of the fantastic. And so um, I, I pose a question, like, like there's, a, there's a, a game I call what if, um, and the what if can go in, 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 any, kind of, in any kind of way, um, it can be playful, but it, it, it's also like a sort of a serious question. There's sometimes a serious question I ask myself in this sort of what if a scenario is that, when I want to gauge a sense of what kinds of choices I'm making um, in my life and which way I'm going with it. I ask myself the, the, um, the ghost question, which is if I were to suddenly die, um, uh, and so what if, what if I suddenly die, um, would I be a mostly contented ghost of having, you know, my complex life with its ups and downs and all the struggles and the suffering, but all the beauty and the joy and the really yummy food and all these different things that made me happy. Um, would I be a mostly satisfied ghost? Or would I be a ghost that is filled with regrets, a ghost that is unhappy with what I've chosen in life and so that I need to haunt, that I need to haunt because I'm so unhappy. Um, I didn't get to do the things that I wanted. I didn't get to do something that made my heart glow. Um, would I be happy ghost, satisfied ghost? Would I be unhappy, unhappy ghost? Um, and you know, it's rather simplistic, um, but it, it does have me kind of think through what kinds of choices I've been making um, and where I'm heading towards. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do that now and then. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my most recent book, um, Shadow Life. So this just came out um, in, in the spring of this year. And um, it's my first uh, graphic novel, um, which was um, really exciting to kind of work uh, through as, as a writing, um, writing process because it's quite, quite different than writing novels. Um, and it was an interesting challenge. Um, but um, I'm gonna read um, a little bit from it and share um the screen so you can see the images from the um the book so can everyone see that yeah okay great so um sorry gotta sort through my papers So I'm going to read the, the text from here. Um, so these are these are jelly images from the um, graphic novel. Um, and I'm reading to you from the text. Uh, so this is what the artist received. Um, and then so you have sort of a background view of how the graphic novel was written, as opposed to what you end up with um, as a uh, reader of the book. Time period, 2010-ish, location, Vancouver. Small furnished independent living bedroom, single occupancy, lower middle class, pretty nice, a large window. Room is only lit by one lamp beside the bed. Many shadows cast, dark figure of a short, stocky old woman, Kumiko, Japanese Canadian, 76 years old, in silhouette. No face shot, never throughout this sequence, only details of her hands, sturdy, a little arthritic, wrinkled. She selects items from dresser um, and places them in a large piece of cloth. 
As she lays down items of clothing, she intersperses with framed photos she takes from atop the dresser. There are a lot, she can't take them all. Selects a photo of her deceased husband, photos of her three middle-aged daughters. These family photos are a little blurry. blurry. There's a more detailed image of them on page 15. Close up of her old hands reaching for a framed photo of Kumiko mm -hmm. and Alice when they are in their 20s, early 1950s, arms around each other's shoulders. Kumiko is laughing with her head tilted back. Mm -hmm. Alice, Chinese Canadian, longer mm -hmm. face, distinct cheekbones, is turned slightly toward Kumiko's face. On the verge of saying something, they look full of life. Kumiko, face is still unseen, thinks, all these years I still kept this photo. Sound effect from outside her door down the hallway, clatter, clatter, clatter. Kumiko, face still and seen, presses the photo to her chest. Her head is tilted toward the door and hallway outside her room. Sound, sound, clatter, clatter. Kumiko places the photo atop the pile, places clothes on top, then her laptop, pulls two corners of the cloth on the diagonal, ties it in the middle, reaches it for two opposite corner, ties them in the middle. She is left with a big square bundle, which she hangs over her shoulder or off her back. She mm -hmm. slings her purse through her elbow and hefts the heavy bundle in size. It's a relief to leave unnecessary things, but do necessary things have to be so heavy? So determinedly, she grips the knot, slings the bottle onto her back, carries her stuff like an old-fashioned Japanese woman or old-school Japanese thief. She opens her door a crack and peers out at the brighter hallway. She hustles away. So there's a dark shadow following her. I'm no longer reading from the script. I'm just talking now. There's a dark shadow following her as she um, escapes from her housing. Good thing I quit smoking when I did. It never felt right here. And out she goes. So that's the opening sequence of um, Shadow Life. Um, and um, I think that it will be the end of my uh, discussion portion. Um, I would like to posit a writing prompt, but should I do that now or later? Um, Leah, what do you think, or Kagan? Uh, well, maybe, uh, I mean, it's up to you. Uh, we could um, do the writing prompt and, or we could go into Q and A. Uh, yeah, do, I'm, I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you don't have to decide. Um, why don't, we, okay, why don't we do a bit of Q and A first? Um, and then we'll take some questions and if of that kind of tapers and then I'll pose the, the writing prompt for, for you to do on screen or um, in the comfort of your own home later. That sounds great. Uh, okay. So um, if, if you have a question, I invite you to unmute yourself and to just jump in. Or if you're feeling shy, um, please write it in the chat and uh, we'll read it out. Uh, Eve, I see you have your hand up. Oh, I think that was a wave. <laughs> Looks like Eve has to run. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well, well, being confident with this stuff. Hi, Hiromi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I, what a pleasure. Um, I do have to run, but I was so looking forward to next week. And thank you. I was just riveted. Um, Shadow Life, hello, hello, is. Um, oh, thank you so much. Absolutely superb. Yeah, it made me, it, it um, gave me goosebumps many times. And I just thought, of, you know, I, I thought of Margaret Lawrence with Stone Angel and this, this equivalent telling of a story, but a story that hasn't been told. I just, anyway, I just love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you for joining us. My pleasure.
Uh, well, maybe we should offer the prompt uh, just so pe people who are interested might have a little bit more time with it. And then okay. if uh, once the prompt is out there floating around, if some other questions come up based on your presentation, um, you can address them at that time. How about that? Sure thing. OK, so this is the writing prompt. OK, so you wake up in the morning. You're tired. It's one of those nights where you didn't get a good sleep and you have the day ahead of you. You come down to the kitchen and go through your kitchen routine, coffee or tea. You go through the motions. You make your beverage. You drink it. You eat a hurried lunch, grab your stuff and you go towards your door. And your door is there, but there's also a second door where there was only one door to yesterday. There are two now. The one door, which you recognize as the regular door, leads to the life you've been living. The second door leads somewhere else. You're not completely confident, but you open the new door and you step through what's on the other side. That's your writing prompt. Go.
So I'm just being um, mindful of the time. It's been five minutes and we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, we try to keep this within an hour just so people can move on with their day or maybe take that prompt and think about it for another hour. <laughs> uh, that was a lovely prompt. And um, I hope we have time to maybe read a couple of them. Um, but first I'd like to ask Hiromi, well, first <laughs> I will want to thank you for the generous readings and the thoughtful sort of um, introspection on what uh, you produced over you know, 30 years and how um, that kind of unravels uh, for, uh, to put it in perspective, for daring to think uh, in different ways and produce different options uh, as an artist and as a writer. So I think that was really um, uh, generative for us as an audience. Uh, but I was hoping we can go back right to the introduction and how you make a point of stating that you are engaged with decolonizing your writing practice and what um, kind of strategies you um, you employ in that in that uh, idea or method of working and unlearning um, it's hard to I, I, it's very very challenging to decolonize uh, my thinking and my creative and critical practice um, because I've been formed. My thinking has been shaped within this colonial system. So, I mean, the first challenge is to realize that exists. Um, and then the second challenge is to start understanding how it works. Um, and then the third challenge is to start trying to unravel it from within um, and also outside of one's life, like within what your own thinking and then outwardly through actions. Um, and it's, it's really hard work um, in so much that really, really sh shapes, um, it really, really shapes your own thinking. So what you think, so what someone can think of, well, well, that's just the way things are. Well, it's actually, you know, you can really believe that's just the way things are, but it's actually, it's, it's, it's a system that's taught, but we've, it's been taught so deeply that it's hard to separate what the system is from one's own quote unquote natural thinking. So um, I, I find it a, a struggle um, not to reinscribe colonial practices within my own um, stories and within my own thinking. So um, for a while, I actually kind of had to stop trying to produce things so that I can take in more rather than trying to produce. So put, like putting a pause to um, putting out things um, and taking in stories and teachings, um, particularly from indigenous writers and teachers um, to try to dismantle and, and address the gaps in my own thinking and learning. Um, so, you know, so uh, listening, you know, is, is very, very important. Um, also to sit with discomfort um, because, you know, to have, point, to have, uh, have it pointed out that one's thinking is um, bigoted or um, narrow or whatever um, is, is not easy. And the first, you know, it's very instinctive to say, oh, that's not true, I, I'm not that person. Um, but, you know, there are, there are so many gaps in, in, the, in the ways that we are in this world thinking and what we don't understand. And so sitting still, listening, um, sitting with discomfort um, and, you know, also be having the capacity to have, in, 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 well, I can't say it introspection introspection um at that moment where you feel most resistant 
to be able to stop and say, okay, why, why do I feel so resistant on this particular point? Like, what is it? What, what do I think? Do I think I have something to lose? Um, why do I think I have something to lose? Is that thing I have to lose power? Um, or have I shaped part of my identity based upon, um, you know, subjugation of, of, of an idea, subjugation, an idea of subjugation of, of somebody else? Um, so, you know, I think these are some of the things I do um, to try to decolonize. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't know if I, I it, can, it, it can be, comp I don't think it's completely done decolonization. I think it's, it's always work to be done to continue practicing it, but I don't think I will ever reach decolonization. It's just like, I, I don't think that can happen. So I think it's always a practice of trying to decolonize. Um, yeah. Thank you. Are there other questions for Hiromi? Other, like whether um, you want to speak them or write them out? This is Sylvia. I would love to know how to get my face on screen. I keep trying all sorts of little boxes. I'm too old for this technology. So if you, sl if you slide your cursor, your mouse towards the bottom of the screen, there should be a, a video button to the left. Oh. If you move the mouse towards the bottom left of the, the screen. There's nothing. Had a flash of green there for a second. Flash of anyway, I don't want to take up time. It's okay. Okay. Very um, can hear you, Sylvia. So if you have yeah, a question, we, yeah. you, can, you can speak it. Okay. Can I? Can you hear me now? Oh yes. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. You just can't see me. No, we can't see you, but we can hear you fine. You sound great. So carry on. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, who would like to read a prompt then? <laughs> or an answer or response to Hiromi's prompt? Anyone? <laughs> I don't get the language. I try smiling. A child shrieks in fear. Others turn away in embarrassment. I check. Yes, I have clothes on. I sit to observe. Um, they, I, I sit to observe the scene, which is not exotic. It must be something unexpected about me. So I will wait in silence to see what happens next. My heart pounds, not in fear, but excitement. That's it. Thank you, Sylvia. It sounds like uh, something new and unexpected will be happening. I've already had an extraordinary life. So yes, that's what it's about. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I can read mine. Okay. Field of daisies, maybe a boat on a dock, some rocks, tied beer bottles on the shoreline, keeping cold. I'm really old, keeping folded notes inside pages of a book. Look back to see the house I left looks just like me. Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I am going to step away for a second just to open up the Arts Council, but I'm going to leave the Zoom going uh, so you guys can finish your conversation. But Hiromi, I just, if in case I don't see you, I, I just want to thank you for 
your wisdom. Um, I, I wrote down a couple of things that you've said throughout your, your talk, and, and I just really want to thank you for spending your time with us this morning. Thank you so much, Leah. It's almost unfair to ask, but it's always, you know, the question on so many audiences' mind, uh, especially on the heels of a freshly um, released uh, book or publication project. But what are you working on next? <laughs> you, you can tell me. <laughs> how, how dare you be that person? <laughs> I dare. I dare. <laughs> Um, actually, I'm, I'm taking a, a, another leap, um, and um, I've, uh, I've been um, taking a lot of photographs and oh. going back to what really was uh, grounding for me as, as a child, which is the, the wider natural world. Um, so I take like tons and tons of photographs of all the living things um, and thinking about their lives, um, living beside them. And, and so it, I'm working on a creative nonfiction um, project that, uh, you know, integrates some of the photographs and sort of my, um, I guess, relationship with um, all the living, non-human living um, beings um, all around me. All the time and so centering parts of their lives um i i don't think i, I can speak for them in any way um, um you know i'm not a disney uh animal show thank goodness <laughs> um but yeah yeah and also you know a lot of books are very human centric um and um i guess i wanted to voice uh, other sort of other lives in, in yeah. so that's what I'm working on um okay are there other questions uh, from the audience for Hiromi Gato if not I I'm just again always rec recognizing the time and and I'm so grateful for people taking time out of their morning to join us on these um, excursions as it were uh so I will wrap up by thanking our guest Romagato once again, as well as plugging the Victoria Festival of Authors, which starts next Wednesday. And we're so lucky because Hiromi is one of the um, authors that's helping kick off the festival. So if you're interested in hearing Hiromi speak again, along with uh, Patrick Friesen, Julie Paul, and Troy Sebastian Nepku. Uh, moderated by Eve Joseph, who was joining us here earlier, um, you can go to the Metro Theatre or you can log online. Um, so just go to uh, victoriafestivalofauthors.ca and you can find out more information. But again, um, Hiromi is presenting September 29th at 7.30 next, uh, next week as part of the festival. And I, I think that's uh, the sole engagement, right, Hiromi? There's not another one I'm missing? Uh, not at that festival. I'm also right. in Vancouver, but, you know, this... <laughs> that's another partnership we're not part of <laughs> yeah. but definitely and, and of course um Hiromi's website uh which I'm sure you know more th better than I do but I want to say hiromigato.ca uh, uh, yes yeah. yes I'll, I'll yeah. write so it down very informative website we uh we're happy to, <laughs> to have access to it um but again thank you so much uh, thank you Leah for organizing all the technical aspects as usual and um, yes, have a wonderful day and uh, have a great reading next festival or Thanks. next week at the festival. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you everybody who joined in. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.